Story 1. Guy sends wife an inappropriate text. One day, my wife received an unexpected message from one of her single male friends. He had sent her a clip from an early 2000s TV show, featuring a rather peculiar scenario. In this clip, a police officer had arrived at a house in response to a noise complaint. As it turned out, the couple living there was engaged in quite the passionate activity. And their young daughter had dialed 911, because she was convinced that mommy was in some sort of trouble. The clip was roughly two minutes long, and it was filled with humorous interactions. The father of the household, with a mischievous glint in his eye, bantered with the cop as he read through the incident report. Lines like, yeah, she said that and keep it down were thrown around in good humor, creating a light-hearted atmosphere. The dad even quipped, I can't for another few minutes, eliciting laughter from everyone involved. The highlight of the clip, however, was the father's conversation with his little daughter. His responses to her innocent questions were laced with subtle innuendos, leaving the audience in stitches. It was the kind of humor that could be taken in two very different ways, and it added an extra layer of hilarity to the situation. My wife, in her innocence, forwarded the clip to me, thinking I might find it amusing. I couldn't help but wonder about the person who had sent it to her. Curiosity got the best of me, so I asked her for his name, and she promptly shared it with me. I decided to send him a message to express my feelings about the situation. Hey man, I thought the clip was funny. But I'd appreciate it if you could keep suggestive content to yourself when it comes to my wife. So here I am, pondering whether I might be considered the proverbial jerk in this situation. Story 2. I Ida for giving my wife an ultimatum. My wife, female 30, and I, male 34, have been together for seven years, with four of those years spent in marriage. When our journey as a couple began, we shared stories of our encounters with toxic people and how these experiences had left scars on our lives. Over the years, we've diligently worked on healing together. However, a significant challenge has emerged that has strained our relationship. My wife's self-esteem has taken a severe hit as she grapples with the trauma inflicted by her mother. Who could be likened to an overbearing figure on steroids? This trauma has manifested in her strong dislike for her own body, particularly due to the weight she's gained. Regrettably, this has resulted in her reluctance to engage in any form of intimacy because of her negative self-image. Our last intimate encounter happened over two years ago, and even non-intimate closeness has dwindled significantly. I've expressed my feelings of loneliness and isolation to her which have only intensified since she confessed to having a crush on my trans friend while she was living with us. Her desire to get close with my friend was a heavy blow to me. At the time, my friend was staying with us while trying to get back on her feet. But she didn't have a job, and my wife wasn't working either. So I found myself financially supporting both of them, all the while grappling with suspicions of infidelity while I was at work. I still don't know for sure if anything happened between them. The stress from these circumstances eventually led me to seek help from a doctor and resulted in a prescription for anti-anxiety medication. It's hard to feel stressed when you're knocked out cold, right? All of this turmoil culminated in November 2022. Since then, I've consistently tried to communicate my feelings of solitude within our relationship and my eagerness to assist her in achieving a healthier body image, whether through exercise or improved nutrition. However, her resistance to these ideas stems from her own traumatic experiences with her parents, who demanded rigorous physical activity, ski team participation, and constantly shamed her for indulging in any unhealthy foods. Whenever I suggest doing something active together, she accuses me of overbearing parenting her. Approximately two months ago, I once again broached the topic of feeling isolated and unloved. Her response left me stunned. I'm not going to risk my mental health just to keep your warmth. She refuses to engage in any physical activity and recently confided in me about consuming most of a cheesecake. It's essential to clarify that I don't mind if she doesn't work out or indulges in cheesecake and chocolate. What I truly care about is both of us feeling loved and cherished. And right now, that's sorely lacking. Throughout our relationship, we've had numerous disagreements about how she communicates with me. She often comes across as condescending and dismissive. While she recognizes this behavior, apologizes, and I forgive her. It's an ongoing cycle. There's much more to our story, but I've been writing for quite some time. So, here's the question. Am I the individual in the wrong for telling my wife I need more intimacy, or we're heading for a divorce? Story 3. 
Am I the am I the asshole for supposedly stealing attention from the bride and groom? I, a 25-year-old unmarried woman, reside in a quaint small town where my family, despite its considerable size, is composed mainly of children raised by other family members due to a multitude of young pregnancies and affairs. I find myself in the role of the unofficial guardian of my sister's child, the unfortunate result of her struggles with addiction. Technically, the child's father has custody. But he sent my niece to live with me to avoid court battles and maintain a semblance of peace in his own life. It's the way things often unfold in our community, where we do our utmost to preserve family harmony and minimize trauma. Last year, my cousin Jay, aged around 25 or 26, got engaged to Lisa, a young woman in her early 20s, with whom we had attended school. Jay belongs to my mother's side of the family. And although I don't interact with them as frequently due to their somewhat judgmental and overly religious nature, I still hold a deep affection for them. When Jay announced their upcoming wedding, I offered my congratulations but didn't involve myself further. Little did I know, this wedding held more significance than I initially thought. Not only was it the first wedding in our family among newlyweds, the recent weddings had been second or third marriages, but it was also set to take place at a charming venue by a small lake. I was genuinely impressed. As our family weddings had always been simple affairs, a church ceremony followed by a backyard party, or BBQ, this wedding piqued my interest. I gathered more details from Jay and learned that the wedding would be in late summer or early fall, ensuring comfortable weather. The invitation specified a formal dress code, allowing us to wear our usual church attire. The date for the wedding was set for August 24th of the current year. I thought it was perfect and took time off for the day before the day off, and the day after the wedding. I even took my niece shopping for a prettier outfit since she wasn't too fond of her church dress. However, seven months later, in July of the same year, we received an unexpected notification that the wedding would be child-free. Panic ensued among everyone, including myself. We had all been making plans, taking time off work, and preparing outfits, only to receive this late announcement. For a week, discussions about Jay and Lisa's wedding dominated our family's conversations. It became a touchy subject, and even talking to my mother was challenging, as she would bring it up with frustration, despite her own children being grown. Personally, I felt that Lisa hadn't been given a fair chance to discuss the matter. So I took it upon myself to call and speak with her. I expressed my concerns about the timing of the decision and emphasized how prominent children were in our family. I explained that our small town with a population of 5,000 lacked available babysitters, and my nine-year-old niece couldn't be left alone during the day. Lisa's response, however, was far from understanding. She accused me of trying to guilt-trip her, claimed that the family was pressuring her and Jay, and insisted that we were free to skip the wedding. The decision was final. Despite my efforts to persuade her, she abruptly hung up. After that, I chose not to raise the issue again. I was genuinely upset that I had taken time off work for an event I could no longer attend. But fate had something in store for me. My PTO for the wedding was denied during the first week of August. Now, attending the wedding without my niece was impossible. To clarify, I work night shifts as a registered nurse. I put my niece to bed before heading to work, and I'm back home when her school bus arrives. I couldn't bring myself to leave her alone for 24 hours as her father had done before. The week of the wedding finally arrived. My niece and I were spending time together when she asked if I was going to the wedding. I regretfully answered no, to which she responded, Oh man, I wanted BBQ. I told her there probably wouldn't be any BBQ, as it was a very fancy wedding. We had a playful back and forth. And it ultimately led to me planning a BBQ at my place for those who couldn't attend the wedding. I selected the day of the wedding, as many had already taken the day off work. I reached out to a few family members, simply asking if they were attending the wedding. If they replied yes, I respected their choice. If they said no, I extended an invitation to the BBQ. On the day of the wedding, my backyard was bustling with activity. My uncle manned the grill, my cousin brought ribs, and my aunt contributed deviled eggs. It was a fantastic gathering, and even some of my dad's family joined in the festivities. The wedding was scheduled for around 5 p.m., but we fired up the grill at 12.1 p.m. As we delved into the delicious food, our phones started ringing. My aunt, who is Jay's mother, received a call that drew everyone's attention. Later, I inquired about the conversation, which went something like this. Jay, mom, where are you? Aunt, 
I'm at a BBQ at OP's place. Why do you ask? Jay, I heard Mark, cousin, say you weren't here. What's going on? Aunt, well, the wedding specified no kids under 18. And you know I have to watch your brother. Jay, he's 17 years old. He can take care of himself. What do you mean? Aunt, and you could have looked after your own family too. Hangs up following this exchange. Jay immediately called me. And our conversation was far from pleasant. Me? Yeah? Jay. So, you're just going to throw a party on my wedding day? If you had an issue with me, you could have mentioned it earlier. Me. I don't have an issue with you. You knew everyone had children and had to take the day off work. Jay, so... No one could find a babysitter? No one? You've had half a year. Me. You didn't inform anyone until a month ago. So, don't act like that. Ask your parents why they didn't attend. I hung up as well, because I didn't want to engage in further conflict. Despite the tense phone call, the day was a tremendous success. And I even had enough food to sustain me during my night shift. The following day, I woke up to my phone, overflowing with messages. I normally keep my phone on do not disturb mode during the night, as I need my rest for my nursing job. When I checked the messages, I found a barrage of passive-aggressive texts from that side of the family. I facepalmed and sighed. They had attended the party, but now, it seemed, they were blaming me for even hosting it in the first place. As weeks passed, and my mother continued to pressure me to apologize to my cousin-in-law, I found myself wondering, am I truly at fault here? Story 4. Am I the asshole for not wanting to have my husband's family bringing birthday cake to our apartment when my husband made it clear he didn't want my family there? I recently turned 40, and the idea of celebrating with a party for both my family and friends, totaling around 30, 35 people, had been swirling in my mind. Our spacious apartment could effortlessly accommodate this many guests. Living in the same city as my family meant they often visited us, taking advantage of our larger living space while they were frequent guests. It wasn't a weekly or even monthly occurrence for all of them to gather together in one place. So, I didn't see any harm in it. Normally, I didn't even make a fuss about my birthdays. But this one felt special due to the milestone age. However, when I mentioned my plans to my husband, his reaction surprised me. And not in a pleasant way. He appeared noticeably irritated. Later, he explained that he felt my family had a habit of frequently gracing our home while we weren't invited to their homes as often. It stung a bit because it was partially true, but we lived in a bigger space, and I was the oldest, which somehow made our place the natural gathering spot. I have three siblings and my mom, and about 50% of our gatherings took place at our home, with the other 50% at their places. In an attempt to alleviate his concerns, I suggested hiring catering and extending our cleaning services. We already had a cleaning lady twice a week, I could just book her for an extra shift. Despite my efforts, he remained upset, expressing his fatigue from always hosting my family. His reaction hurt me deeply. Without revealing my husband's reasons, I confided in my mom about the situation and floated the idea of hosting the party at her place instead, to which she readily agreed. However, there was a twist waiting for me. My sister had already booked a restaurant with a private room for a surprise celebration though I had slyly discovered her plan in advance. All the guests were planning to gather there, which seemed like the perfect solution. Yet, things got more complicated when my husband's family, who lived in a neighboring city an hour away, expressed a desire to have cake at our place after the restaurant dinner. My husband quickly agreed to this, but I was hurt and conflicted. He argued that it was different because his family didn't visit as often, and he couldn't say no to them especially since they were making a special effort to attend my birthday celebration. I found myself torn and growing increasingly angry about the situation. It puzzled me that he could so easily say no to my family, who adored him and had planned a surprise party that they'd already paid for. However, he couldn't bring himself to decline his family's request, even though they were essentially guests at this point. I had no issue with having cake at the restaurant, as many places allowed bringing in cakes for special occasions. What made it even more challenging was that his family wasn't at fault, and it felt unfair to punish them for his earlier frustrations. I'm well aware that this might seem like a minor issue, but the frustration it's causing me is significant. The party is scheduled for tomorrow, and if my sister hadn't already booked and paid, I would seriously consider canceling everything. Thank you for listening.
Story 5, Am I the asshole for blocking my husband and considering divorce after him not prioritizing our family? Let me share a deeply personal story with you. One that revolves around a challenging time in my life. Lately, my physical health has been on a steady decline due to my menstrual cycles. The excessive blood loss has taken a toll on my body, affecting my hemoglobin levels and overall well-being. Despite seeking medical advice, specialists found nothing amiss with my reproductive organs. One fateful day, when my period hit with excruciating pain and heavy bleeding, I made a beeline for the doctor's office. Upon arrival, my blood pressure teetered on the brink of normalcy at 100-60, considering the substantial blood loss. Without hesitation, the medical team swiftly arranged for an ambulance to transport me to the nearest hospital. As I was being rushed to the hospital, I desperately tried reaching out to my husband, only to be greeted by his voicemail. My text messages went unanswered as well. In my anxious state, I decided to call my mother and our baby's nanny, informing them that I wouldn't be returning home for several hours. At the hospital, the doctors sprang into action, attending to me with a flurry of needles and treatment. Thankfully, my condition began to improve as time passed. An hour later, my husband finally responded to my messages claiming that he hadn't noticed his phone earlier and inquiring about my well-being. I explained that my mother was by my side at the hospital, but our daughter was left alone with the nanny at home. His response caught me completely off guard. He casually stated that he couldn't make it home, providing no explanation other than a vague, I wish I could have come home earlier if I'd seen your messages, but I can't. I couldn't fathom his response. My wife was hospitalized. Our daughter was alone and he had something seemingly more pressing on his agenda. When I demanded an explanation for this shocking decision, he nonchalantly informed me that his male best friend needed his help. The feeling of being unimportant and betrayed washed over me. In times of crisis, one would expect their family to be the foremost priority, and yet we weren't for him. I couldn't bring myself to care about the specifics of his friend's request to me. It felt like something that could have waited, especially in the face of an emergency. I write these words from my hospital bed, still trying to process the emotions swirling within me. In my state of hurt and frustration, I took a decisive step and blocked him. The prospect of confronting him about how he made me feel looms uncertain, and thoughts of separation and divorce have crossed my mind. If I couldn't rely on him during this critical moment, what assurance do I have that such a situation won't recur? So, am I the one in the wrong here? Story 6 Am I the asshole for taking my daughter out to eat? Let me share with you a story that unfolded in my life. I'm a 39-year-old man with a 16-year-old daughter from a previous marriage. It's important to understand that I met my now 37-year-old wife when my daughter was just 10 years old. At that time, my wife had a 7-year-old son of her own. Our relationship was a wonderful blend, and our connection was palpable throughout our journey together. Around five months into our relationship, I took the step of introducing my wife to my ex-wife, who is 35 years old, and my beloved daughter. To my relief, both my ex-wife and my wife managed to maintain a cordial relationship, and my daughter warmed up to my new partner surprisingly quickly. As far as I could tell, they had developed a genuinely good relationship over time. Now my daughter had always been quite the picky eater. For instance, she wouldn't touch oatmeal, tomatoes, garlic, mushrooms, barbecue or anything that had a salty or sour kick to it. On the flip side, she had an undeniable passion for spicy food and sweets. Trying to trick her into eating something she disliked was a futile endeavor. Once, when she was 13, I surreptitiously slipped a single garlic clove into the melted butter I was using to make her grilled cheese. To my amazement, she detected it right away, despite the relatively mild taste. Her taste senses were truly remarkable, and her stubbornness impressed me. She ignored me for a whole week and refused to eat anything I cooked during that time. Needless to say, I never attempted such a stunt again. My work schedule typically involved a 5-8 shift. However, there was an exception one day when I got off around 9 due to an urgent work project that required us to hurry and finish our part. When I arrived home, my wife had thoughtfully prepared dinner and left my plate in the oven for me to heat. As I began to eat, I stood at the kitchen island and engaged in conversation with my wife who was in the living room with our son. It wasn't long before I noticed something unusual about my plate. My wife had cooked garlic stir-fried rice, barbecue chicken, and a vegetable salad consisting of corn, tomatoes, mushrooms, and spinach. 
I stopped mid-conversation and simply stared at my plate for what felt like an eternity. My wife, concerned, inquired if there was something wrong with the food. Finally, after what seemed like a long pause, I couldn't help but ask what my daughter had eaten. As everything on my plate happened to be foods she disliked, there was a brief silence. And then my wife reluctantly revealed that my daughter hadn't eaten anything since lunch. Needless to say, I was deeply troubled by this revelation. I asked her why she hadn't adjusted the meal to accommodate my daughter's preferences. Her response was defensive, claiming that my daughter was merely being dramatic and that she could still eat if she was hungry. This sparked a heated argument between us. And I emphasized that it wasn't that simple for a selective eater like my daughter. After a protracted exchange, I decided to end the conversation by ignoring my wife. I felt that my daughter's wishes had been disregarded, and it was time for me to take action. I took my daughter out to eat, also picking up some sweets along the way. During our outing, we bonded and talked extensively. It was during this heart-to-heart -heart that I discovered my wife had been intentionally cooking food that my daughter despised. My daughter, ever reluctant to complain had resorted to using her own money to ensure she didn't have to eat the meals my wife prepared. On this particular night, she had no intention of dipping into her savings to buy dinner. We returned home around midnight, and my wife was visibly upset that I had taken my daughter out instead of convincing her to eat the meal she had prepared. I knew that my wife and I had a lot to discuss when I was off work, as this was a concerning situation that needed resolution. Story 7 UPD at TE, am I the asshole for taking my daughter out to eat? I arrived home approximately an hour ago and spent about 15 minutes reading the comments. Mm. I'll address questions at the end of this post. Mm. The conversation with my wife was, well, not exactly smooth. I approached her, seeking answers about what had been bothering her. She appeared hesitant, clearly reluctant to dive into this discussion. After a moment, she opened up and revealed her frustrations. She disliked cooking for our daughter. According to her, it was too much trouble to constantly cater to our daughter's specific tastes and textures. And she found it annoying to ensure every meal met her preferences. Shockingly, she admitted to altering her cooking style because our son didn't like it, essentially compromising our daughter's meals. My wife went on to express her belief that our daughter needed to grow out of her pickiness, stating it was merely about food and wouldn't harm her. I questioned why she hadn't attempted to mediate a compromise between our children. Her response was startling. She prioritized our son's needs over our daughter's. She even confessed to discontinuing more than half of the personalized groceries my daughter requested because she considered it a waste of money. Our son, on the other hand, got the snacks he desired. I was taken aback and asked if she was willing to let our daughter go hungry. Her reply was simple. Our daughter should eat what she cooked. I couldn't comprehend why it was such a challenge to set aside a piece or two of plain chicken for our daughter. She argued that I didn't understand because I didn't cook for her like she did. It was true, I was at work from five to nine, only able to prepare dinner on weekends, holidays, and during breaks. She apologized. But her solution was for me to convince our daughter to eat food she disliked because it would make everyone's life easier. I countered by asking if she would hold the same stance if our son were in our daughter's shoes. Her silence provided the answer. Now I'm at a loss if she's willing to let our daughter go hungry. What else might she be willing to neglect? What should I do now? QA to address some additional details. My daughter is not overweight. And she does eat a variety of vegetables and fruits. She can even cook herself, but she refrained from doing so because her fall break was approaching. And my wife hadn't purchased her entire grocery list. It's baffling to think that a child should worry about how much food they can eat when they're hungry. My daughter confided in her biological mother, who is understandably upset and has suggested that my daughter come to live with her. My daughter has the autonomy to choose where she spends the year, and if she wants to go, I won't stand in her way. I refuse to subject my daughter to neglect. It's essential to clarify that I don't force my wife to cook for my daughter. She insists on it. If she were to express her reluctance to do so, I'd gladly adjust my schedule or wake up early to prepare our daughter's meals. My wife typically does one grocery run per month. So if she can't get everything on my daughter's list, it naturally limits her meal option. I've spoken with my daughter, and she's not angry with my wife. In fact, she's urging me to forgive her. It's quite perplexing that my 16-year-old daughter is trying to mend our marriage, while my wife seems indifferent to my daughter's well-being. My daughter is even willing to accompany my wife on grocery shopping trips, 
and pay for her own food to eliminate any further conflicts. Some people have suggested that my daughter might have a FRID disorder, and I'm certainly going to explore that possibility. Now, I need advice on how to proceed with my wife. On one hand, I love her deeply, but on the other, I can't fathom being with someone who's willing to neglect my daughter. Story 8. Am I the asshole for telling my female 23, husband male 23, that I don't want to have the same gender roles in our marriage as his parents? 48F, 67M. Title, Seeking Advice on a Surprising Marriage Proposal, Hello, Everyone. I find myself in a somewhat perplexing situation and thought it best to seek some advice here. Under the guise of anonymity. You see, my husband, who I'll refer to as James, and I are newlyweds. Our love for each other knows no bounds, and I am overjoyed to be his wife. We actually began dating during our college years. But considering that both of us attended schools far from our hometowns, it took a while for me to truly get to know his parents a sweet couple with a rather substantial age gap comprising James' mother, 48 years old, and his father, 67 years old. To offer some context, my husband's parents, James' mother, and father, embarked on their journey together when she was a mere 21 years old, while he was already 40. I know this might raise eyebrows, but bear with me. That's not the focus of my story. For the first 14 or so years of their union, James' mother dedicated herself to caring for James and his three younger siblings, while his father served as a pastor. However, about a decade ago, she took up a teaching position, working exhausting hours approximately 70-80 hours per week during the school year. Remarkably, she continues to maintain this intense workload to this day. Now, let me take you to last night when James and I had a conversation that caught me entirely off guard. We were discussing the possibility of a career change for me. Currently, I work as an assistant, but my true passion lies in the field of data science, which aligns better with my college degree. James, on the other hand, works as an assistant for the local government. During our conversation, he suggested that we adopt a lifestyle reminiscent of his parents, me stepping away from work once we have children, and resuming my career once they're a bit older. According to him, he could continue working full-time to provide for our family, while I would manage all household responsibilities and childcare. Naturally, I was taken aback by this proposal since James had never broached the topic before. I expressed my reservations explaining that emulating his parents' model wouldn't work for us due to several crucial factors. Firstly, my educational background qualifies me for a field far more financially rewarding than James. Secondly, James, at the age of 23, is not in the same financial position as his father was at 40 when he married. Thirdly, I genuinely enjoy working and have ambitions beyond solely being a homemaker. Additionally, James and I possess differing skill sets compared to his parents. For instance, I am more financially adept, while James excels in culinary arts. Most significantly, I've observed how, despite working 40-50 more hours per week than his father, James' mother continues to shoulder the entirety of household duties from cooking to cleaning to all matters related to their children. This is largely because James' father has shown little interest in, or effort toward, learning these essential responsibilities. Needless to say, I wish to avoid such a situation. James, however, was quite upset by my response. He believed that I was insinuating that his father is lazy and that I was disparaging their marriage. He contends that their arrangement worked well for them. So why wouldn't it work for us? As a result, he remains upset with me today. While I find myself somewhat blindsided by the entire conversation, I certainly did not intend to offend him. But this vision of our future is a far cry from what I had previously understood. So am I the one in the wrong here? Story 9, Am I the Asshole for Lying to My Parents About Being Infertile? Last weekend, I, a 25-year-old woman, paid a visit to my parents, just as I usually do every few months. Like clockwork, my dad delved into the familiar topic of how I ought to find a man because, according to him, my biological clock was relentlessly ticking away, and I was hurtling toward an inevitable fate as an old spinster who would never marry or have children. We seemed to have this conversation on repeat, and I had grown weary of it. Don't get me wrong, I did want children. But I needed financial stability first. Instead of working a relentless 60-hour week just to cover my rent. This time, however, I found myself growing exceedingly annoyed and snappy. I decided to employ a little white lie to deter this persistent interrogation. I informed my father that just last month, 
My gynecologist had given me the heart-wrenching news that I was infertile. I admitted that I was still in the process of mourning the children I would never have and his incessant reminders about having kids had been tearing open a fresh wound in my heart. Surprisingly, my father offered a heartfelt apology, as did my mom, and this time, the conversation reached its long-awaited conclusion. I felt a fleeting sense of relief, but the relief was short-lived. It seemed my parents had taken my story to heart and promptly shared it with their circle of friends. Soon, messages of sympathy began to inundate my inbox. Their friends expressed their condolences for my perceived loss, and assured me that adoption was always a viable option. As I read these messages, guilt began to creep in. I realized that I had resorted to a lie to escape an uncomfortable conversation, but in doing so, I had unintentionally orchestrated a web of sympathy and concern from well-meaning friends of my parents. Now, I was left grappling with the weight of my own falsehood.